Oh, thank you all for this. And we'll, um, we can show this later if we need to refer to it, but it's great to see the breadth of experience in the room. Um, and uh, we're really thrilled to be able to welcome Eileen Rickey from the LEND program uh, to, the, to present with uh, her team today for the Center for Excellence event. And I think I will um, turn the screen sharing back over to Grace um, and um, we'll refer to our polls and we'll, we'll be polling again. So keep that open. And um, Grace will uh, get us started with some opening remarks from Eileen, I think. So welcome everyone. Thanks, Chris. And welcome everyone to this interprofessional presentation by Maine LEND trainees and faculty. Uh, I thought I might give a bit of information about what LEND is and what we do. LEND stands for Leadership Education in Neurodevelopmental and Related Disabilities. And we provide long-term graduate level interdisciplinary training as well as interdisciplinary services and care. The purpose of the LEND training is to improve the health of infants, children, and adolescents with disabilities by preparing trainees from diverse professional disciplines to work together and to eventually assume leadership roles in their respective fields and by ensuring high levels of interdisciplinary clinical competence. There are 52 LEND programs nationally funded by HRSA and the Maternal and Child Health Bureau. And in 2016, Maine received funding for its first LEND program devoted entirely to the state of Maine. Since 2016, we've trained dozens of long-term trainees in interprofessional practice to improve healthcare for children with developmental disabilities and promote innovative practices to enhance clinical competency and family center care. And it's been a lot of fun. The case you're about to see will demonstrate these characteristics of uh, cultural competency and family center care. And your panelists are LEND trainees who have worked hard with this client in our family interprofessional team, which we call the FIT. There's always an acronym for everything. The family interprofessional team is called such because we put the family first in all that we do. We consider what the family wants for their child. Uh, these are children who have encountered maybe some difficulties in school or clinical settings, and uh, they might need help to achieve their goals. So we consider what they, what they want and we help them to achieve those goals. We might see children in their homes, uh, at school or in their communities. And by the way, if this presentation speaks to your professional calling, we would love to hear from you as a potential trainee. We are composed of faculty and trainees from the disciplines of audiology, physical therapy, occupational therapy, school psychology, social work, speech language pathology, nursing, public health, special education, and family and self-advocate. We're currently especially in need of public health, nursing, and special education trainees. So there's more information on our website uh, if you'd like to apply, and I encourage you to consider that and enjoy the presentation. Thanks. All right. Hello. My name is Grace Laughlin. I'm the current UNE Pediatric Physical Therapy resident, and I am a Maine LEND Fellow and I graduated from UNE's DPT program in 2020. Today, we will be presenting on interprofessional family-centered care and exploring pediatric telehealth. The objectives for today's presentation will be to describe the role of each professional and the interprofessional team in working with families of children with neurodevelopmental disabilities, recognize the impact transitioning to telehealth has on a family and a child with neurodevelopmental disabilities, and recognize the challenges practitioners face when providing services via telehealth to children with neurodevelopmental disabilities, particularly children who are medically complex. So as Eileen mentioned, uh, we are all from the FIT Family Interprofessional Team, and these are the panelists you will be hearing from today. Um, and we're working with this client and the family. And as Eileen mentioned, the family is the leader of the team and that's how we provide our family-centered care. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, meet us. Tess lives on an island off the coast of Maine with her mother, father, and service dog, Oreo. She has two adult sisters, 
Until she was 15 years old, the family worked hard to have the school system of the island accommodate Tessa's needs for a least restric restrictive uh, school environment and a free appropriate public education as required by law. Uh, when she was 15, it was clear that the school system could not provide this and they paid for her to attend Morrison Center. She began to learn to read and write, mobilize her own wheelchair, ride on an adaptive strike and communicate with an augmentative device when, and she also had a one-on-one -on -one nurse. Due to COVID-19, her parents moved back to the island for her health and safety on the, on the advice of her physician and particularly her pulmonologist. So Tess was genetically tested at two years old with no known syndromes identified. Later, whole exome sequencing or WES was developed which has allowed for better genetic identification and the abnormal genetic sequences of many more syndromes to be identified. Two years ago, Tess was referred by a pediatric neurologist for WES and a diagnosis of atypical Rett syndrome was made. And that was based not only on the genetic test, but also on the new information that had been accumulated on the clinical signs and symptoms of atypical Rett syndrome. A little bit about atypical Rett syndrome. So this syndrome is a neurodevelopmental disorder. It has some of the symptoms of Rett syndrome, but not all of the criteria. And there are several different types of subtypes of atypical Rett syndrome. It can vary from mild to severe, and it's caused by a genetic mutation on an X-linked gene. This syndrome is more common in females and can involve seizures during infancy and later in life, like with tests. Also motor difficulties and periods of regression followed by stabilization. You can also see abnormalities in their EEG. So TESS has a very specific type of peritonia called Gegenhalten. Peritonia is the involuntary velocity dependent resistance to passive movement. And Gegenhalten, which is a subtype of peritonia, is when you try and passively move a person's joint or body part, they will push against you. And the name comes from a German word meaning against stop because there's an increase in resistance the more you try and move the body part. And it is often seen in adults with Alzheimer's disease and it is relatively rare in pediatrics. Hi, I'm Maddie. I am a pediatric registered nurse and I graduated from UNE in the spring of 2020. I currently work in in-home pediatrics as well as outpatient pediatrics and I'm a main LEN trainee. I'm now going to talk to you about some of Tess's medical diagnoses and nursing considerations for these. Intractable epilepsy is a seizure disorder where the patient's seizures are not able to be controlled with treatment. In Tessa's case, her seizures can range from grand mal, also known as tonic-clonic, to petite mal and absence, and she can go from all of these to ju in just one seizure. During her seizures, Tessa's mom relies on her heart rate and breathing stabilization in order to determine the beginning and the end of a seizure. When Tess is coming out of a seizure, she will have a heavy sigh and then inhale strongly as she's been holding her breath for a long time. It will also be important after Tess's seizures, specifically in the first 24 hours, to monitor for her for any signs of aspiration, as this is a common complication of patients with frequent seizures. This is a video of Tess having a seizure. As you can see, mom was tapping her nose at different times this is done to determine whether or not she is actively seizing. If she doesn't blink, then that means she's seizing. But if she does blink, it means she has come out of the seizure. It is possible, though, for her to blink and then go back into a seizure. It's okay, baby. Careful. Tess, take a breath. Take a big breath.
still locked up. Yeah. As you can see by this list of medications, Tess is on several just to control her seizures. She has four different medications that are used daily and one that is used at three different times throughout the day, as well as two PRN medications that are to be given during her active seizures. The reason I say two versus three is the sodium valproate, which is also known as Depakote, mom has currently not given her during one of her active seizures and we'll discuss more of mom's concerns in the next slide. So three years ago when Tess was 14, she was taking Depakote on a daily basis for her seizures. And though it was helping, she was in a constant state of lethargy and grogginess. This was a huge concern for mom because she didn't feel like Tess was herself and as a parent that can be a really hard thing. So the decision was made to take Tess off the Depakote. Since then, it has been brought back up through different doctors that this would be the best thing to give Tess to handle her seizures on a PRN basis instead of on a daily basis. So there's a couple things to think about when talking to a parent about putting a child back on a medication that they previously took them off of. But of course we have to consider what could have caused the constant lethargy and mental fogginess? And what would your responsibility be as a healthcare professional, whether you're the pharmacist, the provider, the nurse, or another professional on her case? As a nurse, the first thing I did was a medication reconciliation, which is done by taking the list of medications and the medication of concern and researching to determine whether or not these have adverse effects when taken simultaneously. The first medication that had an adverse effect when taken with Depakote was clonopin, also known as clonazepam, and these combined can affect control of seizures as well as cause drowsiness. Another medication is banzel or rufinamide, this combination can increase the side effects such as drowsiness and dizziness and can also cause low white blood cell count. This can be of concern as well because when you have a patient who already has an illness, giving them something that could lower their white blood cell count puts them at a higher risk for infection. The next medication is Lamictal or Lamotrigine, which combined can cause seizures, restlessness, and tremors. The last medication that had a reaction when given with Depakote is oxycodone. This combination can cause dizziness, drowsiness, difficulty concentrating, and confusion. So though none of these specifically cause lethargy or decreased mental status, they all have an effect on the patient when taken together. So the question is, what would the next steps be? And what other questions would you have? So as a nurse, this is about as far as I could take it. So my next steps would be to confer with a pharmacist to determine if there was another medication that could be as effective as Depakote, but not have the reactions with the other medications, as well as give my findings to the family to discuss with Tess's primary healthcare provider. Another one of Tessa's diagnoses is chronic respiratory failure with hypoxia. This occurs when there is a buildup of fluid in the air sacs of the lungs, which prevents the release of oxygen into the blood. This happens because the capillaries surrounding the air sacs are not able to exchange CO2 for oxygen due to the fluid. This can be acute or chronic. However, when a patient has acute experiences, they will have immediate symptoms from lack of oxygen in the body. An important nursing assessment would be to monitor for tachycardia, nasal flarings, retractions, or assess for high-pitched crackles by auscultating breath sounds. This is done to determine if the patient is in respiratory distress, as well as how, if there is fluid in the lungs. As a nurse, it's important to closely monitor both the respiratory and cardiovascular status, especially as the disease worsens, and provide support to the family as this can be fatal. Intrapulmonary percussive ventilation, or IPV, 
is used to treat and prevent pulmonary diseases that are caused by the secretion buildup in the lungs. This is done by mobilizing the secretions, creating intrathoracic percussion vibration, and improving the efficiency of ventilation in the lungs. Indications for IPV include diseases such as COPD, cystic fibrosis, restrictive lung disease, bronchitis or bronchopneumonia, patients who are on mechanical ventilation, and patients who are unable to maintain clear lungs or airway, in this case, TEVS. It's important not to use this directly after eating, as there's an increased risk for aspiration to frequently monitor vital signs and to provide supplemental O2 as needed, as well as to have equipment, suction equipment available as there is the risk for aspiration. This is a video of Tess using her IPV machine to help loosen the secretions in her lungs. After she's done with this, she will then use a cough assist to help clear the secretions and improve the efficiency of her breathing. This is done three times a day, as well as on an ad needed basis for tests. Hi everyone, my name is Laura Keach. I'm an audiology student from Syracuse University and I'm one of the mainland trainees. I want to talk a little bit about hearing testing. So while hearing is not a current concern for Tess or her family, it is important to at least rule out. She has had hearing testing in the past and it's important in this situation because Tess is nonverbal, we need to be sure that she can hear what her family or those around her are saying to her. This is typically done during a critical period for speech and language development during early childhood. It could also happen again if her parents or family notice any concerns with her hearing in the future or if she were to start a new medication that has ototoxic side effects, so a medication that can have a negative effect on her hearing, we would want to monitor that with repeat hearing testing. So establishing access to language by checking hearing is the first step for communication. Next, we wanna set, set up a system for tests to be able to communicate back and forth with the people around her. So several years ago, Tess began using an eye gaze device called the Toby Dynavox, um, which allows her to communicate through eye tracking. In this video, Tess's mom, Joanna, talks about the setup of her device. So while you watch, think about the benefits and the potential difficulties with this form of communication. Without trying to do it this way, but it's okay. So this is her main page. Can you see that? Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, the lighting in here is bad, I know. So it's the I need to break my talker, social, yes, no, I need, I want, um, groups, places, people. And so all these, like, you know, I want, I want. to play with Eve, listen to music, you know what I mean? These are all her I wants, mm -hmm. to FaceTime someone, um, to do arts and crafts. And so then we go back to the main page. Go back to the main page. Um, about me. I want to tell you about myself. And this is a page all about Tess. Oh, cool. But she loves to tell you, this is her one of her favorite buttons. Basically, I'm awesome. So you'll have a chance to see Tess use that device later on in the presentation. But for now, I wanted to share some strategies for communicating with someone who is nonverbal. Um, over teletherapy, these things can be particularly difficult, but hopefully these strategies can give you a good starting point. So a couple things to keep in mind is first, communication is a two-way street. So make sure you're still commenting on your environment, talking about what you're doing, explaining things. 
um, even if the person you're talking to isn't communicating back. Next, um, it will be important to figure out what system is already in place for communication. So this is when the family team is really important. Talk to um, your patient or client's parents, um, their friends, the people around them, their caregivers to see what systems are in place. And then work out a system to at least establish a way to answer yes, no questions or make choice questions. So that could be blinking your eye, could be um, tapping your hand. Tess will blink for yes and she won't blink for no. Um, next, make sure to give time to respond. Since communicating is a, is a challenge for people who are nonverbal, they need additional time to make sure they can express all their thoughts and feelings. You want to break down questions and make sure that they're simple and that um, the person is able to respond. And then whatever access to communication is possible, make sure that the patient has that. So if they use a device, make sure it's charged and nearby um, and make sure you're giving them time to use it. And just remember that um, whoever you're working with is a person too with thoughts and feelings and make sure you give them time to share those um, opinions with you. Hi everyone, my name is Jill Blackstock I'm, and I'm an occupational therapist. So Tess will be 18 in June of this year and she will likely not be continuing with her academic studies going forward. And as such, our team is working to help Tess and her family explore new leisure activities that she might enjoy pursuing after graduation. And as an occupational therapist, my goal is to help Tess and her family develop a vision for occupations that she can participate in that are both interesting to her and attainable. And in order to facilitate this, I developed an individualized interest checklist with 16 different activities that were chosen with her known developmental level um, abilities and interests in mind. And I administered the checklist to her over Zoom with her using her talker to answer. In the process, um, the checklist was modified a little bit to be answerable with yes, no questions to better accommodate her communication needs. She stated that 14 of the 16 items were of interest to her. So that will give our team lots of great ideas um, for things to work on going forward. And on the next slide, I've included a short video clip of um, that interview. Do you like bike riding? Do you like to ride your bike? you like to ride your bike while your music plays? Yeah. Yeah, you do. We just did that, didn't we? You did? We went to school. They let us use the gym. All right. We are next going to move into some polls that we have to start facilitating a discussion. So I'm going to stop sharing and send it over to Chris. Thanks, Grace. So good to see everyone here. Um, we're going to go back to poll everywhere now and the link for that is in the chat. Um, but if you had it open before, it should move right to the next question. I can show you for those of you who weren't here at the very beginning, um, we asked a question about um, what experience people had with neuro developmental disabilities and we got a lot of great responses everything from no experience to speak of to people who have been working for years in this in this field and so the next question we have uh, has to do with from the point of view of your own discipline um, we wanted to know what factors are most impacted by the use of telehealth for this kind of, of care. And this is a ranking opportunity. So you'll be able to move the um, topics up and down in the ranking according to what you feel is most impacted. Is it access or attendance or engagement? And I think one of the things that has been surprising to us about uh, the virtual experience is that uh, some, in some aspects it can improve aspects of care. You don't have to transport someone um, to a doctor's office over and over again if some of those appointments can be achieved over Zoom. And I was um, 
interested to hear that, about the interaction that you're able to have with this patient through Zoom uh, as mediated by her mom. Um, I think that must have been a great experience for the for everyone. I and did if you, go, go ahead. A go question ahead. in the chat asked impacted positively or negatively. Either way, go ahead. You can pop in the chat and let us know which you think it was negative, positive. It could be both, and we're open to hearing everything. So I'd be interested to hear from the panel while the poll is populating here um, to just talk about that. So if relationship building is the first impact for you who had experience uh, working with this patient online through Zoom, how do you feel like it impacted your relationship with her or with her family unit? Sana, did you always travel to the island to meet with them? We met us during our uh, period when we started the training. So that was back in September. And so, uh, and this was uh, through the pandemic. So we haven't been able to meet her in person through all this, through, uh, through our training. And so I think the relationship building has been the hardest thing because we only have been able to communicate more with mom than to be able to communicate with Tess as she has to use her gaze. But if we are in person, that would have made a big difference, I think. I don't know what others would wanna chime in too. I agree. It's definitely been a bit challenging because everything has been virtual, but it's been a very, the learning experience and it's, um, I know Jill and Katie got to complete the interest checklist over Zoom with their lives. So maybe they can speak more to how they felt the relationship building was impacted. Yeah, I definitely feel like um, it has been a bit slower getting to know her, um, but I do feel like we were able to develop a bit of a relationship with her while we were giving her the interest checklist. I agree. I think um, it takes more time and maybe a little bit more intentionality, but I think we were still able to see some of her personality um, and get to see her perspective on different things, even though it was over Zoom. Do you feel like you built a greater relationship with her mom because of the interface or, do you, or did it fall into line with the kinds of relationships you have been able to build pre-pandemic with family members? I think in the, the limited time that I spent with her, it was easier to interact with her mom than with her. Um, I think with additional time, maybe it could have been different to where we would have been able to have more of a direct relationship with Tess. But I think, um, I think yes, that teletherapy definitely did um, impact how much we spent talking to her mom versus to her directly. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I would agree with that. Um, but we did try to be very intentional about um, getting Tessa's opinion on things. And we really, we really wanted to hear about what her particular interests were. Were there any elements in this list that were positively impacted by telehealth? I think for me, access, um, they do live on an island. It's about an hour and a half ferry ride to the island. So getting services there can be a struggle. So that has been one thing that switching to remote has allowed us to be able to interact with her much more frequently because everything has been on Zoom. So I'll go ahead and move to our next poll. Um, which uh, gets directly to the interprofessional aspects of the case. So if you think that all of those previous things are affected by telehealth, the, in, the relationship with the team is all similarly affected um, by the need to build relationships often long distance. Can uh, some of you talk about your, what is your practice of communicating with each other about Tess? How have you managed that? 
So we meet weekly over Zoom, and that's usually how we can kind of group, be as one group together, um, and we discuss everything that way. And we also are very frequently emailing one another and setting up the different appointments. And if um, one person is able to go meet with her separately, we just kind of let everyone know how that goes. And then we meet up and we try and get recordings of everything that we can as well. So we can share if people can't necessarily be live in time when we do have interactions. And I think it's been really great to um, be able to see everyone and weekly just through the Zoom. It's allowed us to meet quite frequently, I think. So it's been really, I think it's worked out well. Maybe other team members can speak to something they have struggled with, but yeah. How do you manage the HIPAA considerations? So we use the, um, the Zoom that is HIPAA compliant and we have, uh, they sign consent forms. So when families join our FIT, they're aware that we're all gonna be discussing the case with one another because we're all members of that team. So we're working together for her. Anybody else on the team wanna speak to what folks are seeing or not seeing here? I think that um, Eileen, it might be great to hear from you about um, how values and ethics for interprofessional practice come into play when taking care of this population because um, I can't imagine how complex it must be to think through the needs and how to provide the needs in an equitable and, uh, and um, yeah, effective Yeah, that's a good question, way. Chris. Thanks. Um, each of our trainees has a mentor within their discipline. And uh, for instance, um, uh, Maddie, the nurse that you heard, has Deb Kramlick as her mentor. And so when, when any questions about ethics or values arise, we, every profession has its own uh, code of ethics. And we usually adhere, we, we always adhere to that, but we um, consult that for guidance. So um, a more experienced practitioner, um, like the mentor, would be able to guide a, a younger practitioner in decisions regarding that. And we always consult our, our practice acts for every state, as well as the code of ethics. And we learn a lot about others, others code of ethics, but you'd be surprised at how similar they all are. Mm. Um, you know, they're all based on um, celebrating the, the individual and supporting the individual, their rights, um, there's a communication bill of rights for speech and language pathologists. Um, so we, we learn about how that plays out in different professions, um, but they all make sense because they're based on those um, inalienable rights, if you will. Yeah. And certainly the right to self-determination, which is, right. is hard to determine for Tess because it is difficult uh, to communicate with her. Uh, if you're not trained to do so. Yeah, well, her mother is a very good interpreter and doesn't hesitate to say when Tess is um, being a teenager toward her. Um, Mom will, will quickly share that Tess just told her to shut up or, <laughs> you know, uh, something that, you know, every teenager has done in their lives. Um, but um, it's, uh, she's not only a good interpreter of her you know, language, but also of her feelings and her personality. And so we've learned a lot from her mom. I think it would be so interesting to see in the chat if people have specific questions for this team. Uh, so you have people from many different professions here together on this team uh, providing this care. Uh, and what questions do you have? Um, what uh, what uh, mystifies you about how they're able to go about it? And um, do you have other uh, patients who, who's your experience of them uh, speaks to the competencies in a, in a way that maybe Tess's case doesn't that you could share some uh, HIPAA compliant reflections on? I think for me, I'm really curious about how you, inter how you interface with dental because she must have to go to the dentist at least every six months. Um, 
So I think I'll take that one because I've, I've known the family for longer. Um, they do have a dentist, um, but Tess often needs to be anesthetized before her dental procedures because of her um, unpredictable movements. Um, so it's really, uh, it's a dentist who knows her well. Um, and uh, the family has a cadre of team members in every um, discipline and, and medical subspecialty. Uh, and uh, they really rely on them, but they make the ultimate decisions. So they're doing their best to make the trip to the dentist um, as, as, as uh, painless as possible through anesthesia. Right. Wow. Uh, we have a question in the chat here from John Tamil, who's wondering how clients get referred to and served by the LEND team. Question. Um, so we take referrals. Uh, we, we really haven't had to adver advertise. Um, it's really by word of mouth. Uh, we have former trainees who have referred families back to us because they feel like the family could could use help in um, making the child more successful in school or in navigating their community or um, uh, in some. In one case, it was um, uh, a young man had a had a job. Uh, but he wanted more hours and, um, and, and he had some challenges. And so uh, we helped um, him and his family to navigate those challenges. So it really depends on, on the needs of the child. Um, we have a, a, a fit intake team. Uh, Valerie Jones, who's a social worker, is our fit coordinator. And uh, she takes the uh, requests for a consult and she'll speak with the family and then we'll do an intake and we'll decide whether it's a good fit uh, between the client and, and what services we are able to provide. Um, so we have, when we do intakes, uh, for the most part, uh, we do take the child on because uh, uh, they've heard about our program and, and what we can do. So thanks for that question, John. Shailene. Um, I know you have a, a facilitator on your team who was going to triage the uh, questions in the chat and some are starting to uh, starting to come along. It's 1241 now. We could uh, encourage people to put more questions in the chat. And um, Grace, if you don't mind, I think we'll just go to the next poll while we have it up. Take advantage of the, the final poll question, which is um, a classic interprofessional question uh, having to do with what did you learn from another discipline that may be helpful in your future practice? So you've been hearing from OTs, from PTs, you heard from the speech language pathologist uh, about tests and we can certainly talk about more, more about tests in the Q&A part of it. But um, as, a, as a viewer here, listening to stories from those professions, what did you learn from another discipline that might be helpful in your future practice? And think about the feedback we got in the polls about the competencies, about the difficulty with relationship building or the challenges of communication. Are there anything, is there anything there that you learned that would be helpful to you in your future practice? How do you intend to um, incorporate what you've learned here today in your future care? I think I was really blown away by that speech device because I don't have any idea how it worked, but I was so profoundly glad that it did. <laughs> And your speech pathologist is from Massachusetts. Is, did I hear that correctly in the presentation? Um, I'm actually from Indiana. Oh, from Indiana. Yeah. But, and, and you're studying, what school are you studying at? I just graduated from Purdue University, which is uh -huh. um, in Indiana. Mm -hmm. It's something that I think we feel the lack of uh, quite often here at UNE, not offering that major. Medication, reconciliation, and nursing. I would uh, 
If I could, if Deb Kramlik is on, it would be great to hear anything that you might want to share about your experience with the with this patient or mentoring your nurse, um, nursing student. Actually, I think Deb said she wasn't able to speak because she's uh, in a place where, uh -huh. so she may be reluctant to. <laughs> I, um, I'm the nurse and I can speak to if anybody has anything I just got on, so. Oh, hi, hi Maddie. Maddie, welcome. Thank you. I'm, uh, hello everyone, I'm, I'm Kate Lucas. I'm the mainline training director and occupational therapy faculty. And I did wanna uh, just field, there are a couple of occupational therapy questions that have come through. Um, the important thing uh, that I think people realize is that this is just a very small sh snapshot of Tessa's whole evaluation and intervention. We've actually been working with her since she was 11. And it was through the, uh, a precursor to the LEND program uh, that uh, a group of us worked with Tess and realized her potential, uh, which led to um, Lori Mack, uh, who was on, the, on this uh, call, who is our speech and language pathology faculty member, uh, and the rest of us as a team, uh, Dr. Ricky, uh, myself, and uh, Lori Mack, and others who saw her potential and, um, and worked with, with Boston Children's Hospital to start using a communication device. And, um, and so it's really been a wonderful journey uh, over about seven years of uh, finding out, Tess finding her voice and realizing her potential. Thank you for that, Kate. Some great reflections here. I have a couple questions for the team from the chat, if you guys are ready for those. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so the first one somebody asked is, um, is there any other members from Tess's team on the family that you guys have been communicating with? I can answer that. There um, hasn't been. Tess does have two sisters, um, one of whom is actually her teacher. And we were hoping to meet with her as well, but we haven't been able to yet. And then um, another interesting one was, um, what were some of the other things Tess identified from the interest checklist that she would be interested in? What are some hobbies that she's interested in? Yeah, it was really exciting because she's interested in lots of different things. Um, two things that she really loves are um, music and movies. Um, so we're gonna be working on finding some ways for her to do that in an independent way. Um, she also identified um, photography as something that she's interested in, um, crafts, cooking. Uh, she has she uh, has a dog and she really likes animals. Um, swimming was another thing. Um, yeah, so there. Are, oh, helping people was another one that she was really excited about. So we're we're really excited to help her with those things. It was really awesome to see the results you guys got with that. So thank you. Um, and then some of the OT faculty asked a couple of good questions. Um, the first one was, can you share a little bit more about how Tess acquired her eye gaze communication device and her tricycle? Well, I think I could speak to that because it's kind of a historical question. So um, Tess received her eye gaze communication device really about three or four years ago and um, at Boston Children's Hospital. It was a very expensive device in the tens of thousands. And, um, and the speech language pathologist at Boston Children's Hospital was amazed that she learned how to use the device to communicate in a period of 20 minutes. Uh, and you can imagine the, you know, the difficulty of gazing, you know, fixing your eyes on something in order to answer a question. And then the, uh, you know, the, the beam has to read those movements of the eye in order to uh, speak and answer, and uh, she got it right away, which is uh, was a sign of her intelligence. Um, and the family did do fundraising for that, in addition to having uh, uh, good insurance. For the bike, um, Tess was the last child to receive a trike before the pandemic, um, and her family chipped in to buy her a trike for Christmas. Um, so a lot of extended family members. Um, and that's why she was able to get it so quickly and, and then everything shut down uh, shortly thereafter, so. 
Thanks. But that was through the AMBUX program, which is part of the LEND program. Um, and then another one was, uh, what is the process like recommending and procuring needed equipment for a child such as Tess? Maybe you guys can speak to the bed um, that was brought up at the beginning of the fall, um, something like that. So I can try and speak to that. Um, her physical therapist that she sees uh, through her school is currently working to try and acquire all of the equipment that she needs. And so it has been something that they're now doing oh, remotely. Um, as well, but that's the route that they're going for that, if that answers the question. And then we have one more. Um, are there any assistive devices that could help with um, Tess being able to get in the pool and swim? Actually, other than uh, a lift, uh, she didn't need uh, any assistance in the pool. She was never left unattended. She was always with a PT in the pool when she was at the Marist Center, and she went once a week and loved it. Um, I think it was good preparation for her joints and independent movement uh, to have that pool therapy before she was really able to mobilize her, um, her trike independently. Okay, and then uh, one more off the interest checklist. Um, somebody asked, how will you go about creating a daily structure for tests without infringing on her autonomy? Um, so we are more working on uh, helping to come up with ways for her to be able to do these activities. Um, so we're not going to be really imposing a daily structure um, on her. Um, that will be more up to her and her family. Then this is a good one. I know you guys have worked on a little bit. Um, what does Tess plan to do for housing and long-term care after graduation? And will the professionals currently working with her carry over since she'll be over 18? What happens when she turns 18? I can speak to this one a little bit. Um, so this is one of our... Um, kind of topics that we've been working on with mom and Tess. Um, as a team, mom's biggest thing is um, Tess will remain at home. Um, there's no plans for her to go into a long-term care facility, um, nothing like that. Um, so she'll stay at home. Um, I'm sure you guys have, I just got on some, but I'm sure you guys have talked about kind of the access with COVID. Um, right now, she doesn't really have any, you know, in-home stuff, but once COVID's over, they're hoping to, you know, get nursing back into the home, hopefully get PT and OT back um, into her home. Um, but that's part of what, you know, with this interest checklist, we're trying to find things to keep tests, you know, active and involved. Um, so, um, you know, finding her different things that she wants to do um, for kind of that to help them ease into that transition. Um, but all of her um, services will, be, will carry over. Um, there's a different you know, processes that have to happen with insurance and everything like that, um, but she'll still um, receive her, the services. She's eligible for IDEA Part B services until she's 21. Uh, whether the family chooses to you know, have her access those services or not is up to them. Uh, but it, there are more services through the school uh, than there typically are through uh, adulthood, but you can, um, but there are different types of services in adulthood. All right. Um, somebody asked, are there any adaptive photography tools to allow her to participate in that activity? I know you guys kind of talked about that last week. Yeah, we're working on that. Uh, one idea that we had was using an iPad um, and possibly uh, something like a jelly bean switch for her to be able to take photographs. We thought an iPad would um, allow her to see more. And we encourage adaptive projects or ideas that might come from this, uh, this session today from, from occupational therapy. If anybody has any more questions, feel free to put them in the chat and I can present them to the team for you. Thanks, Sydney, for, um, for emceeing that uh, portion of the event. And I think it would be so amazing for everyone to have a chance, even a little bit, to interact with someone like Tess and provide care for them because she seems like such a striking individual. And I was really, I was really touched by one of the things that she's interested in is helping other people. And uh, do you have any sense of what she means or thinks by that in terms of what she might do because I could see her making appearances or having her own online show or something that could help uh, broaden awareness of, uh, of what her life is like. Did, has anyone talked to her in detail about that at all? 
We don't have too much detail. Um, she, I did ask her if she wanted to volunteer with people and she said yes. That's a little limited right now because of COVID, obviously. Um, but one idea that we had was um, possibly having her make dog biscuits for the local dog shelter because she's also interested in cooking. Yeah, we also discussed having her because she was interested in arts and crafts and she enjoys painting. We were going to have her maybe help create a way that she can maybe like make cards and give to people within the community or set that up. And she was also interested in a pen pal, which we thought was really cool. So we're going to try and set that up for her as well. So that'll be something she can do. That's great. That's great. And as far as COVID and are her and her family, were they in, where were they in the ranking for getting the vaccination? Does anybody know? Yeah, there isn't currently a category for children with special health needs because they're, they range so dramatically and it's hard to, you know, they're doing the ages because they're easy to pinhole into a, mm. uh, but, um, you know, children with special health needs, she is very, very much at risk. Um, and if they do, one of, one of their uh, ideas is to allow physicians who know their caseload to choose those who are very at risk of, of death due to COVID. And uh, she would certainly be in that category, but we haven't gotten to that place yet. So. Definitely illustrates the complexity of trying to manage public health for everyone. Not, not, a, not a job that I, I aspire to, it's be a tough one. Uh, thanks Lydia for your um, reflection in the comments that uh, she could help with Meals and Wheels as a, as a, a wingman for somebody delivering meals to uh, do some cooking and greet people um, as things are being dropped off, perhaps in a less icy <laughs> time than we have right now. So, um, Grace, I feel that we're winding down. We've got about four minutes left. If you want to share your screen again and get our final um, final slides up uh, in the chat, you've been encouraged to um, respond with, to the attendance link. And uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the event and what could have been better and what you really liked about it. Um, we definitely want to thank everyone who presented today. Thank you for your effort in putting together a really great presentation, really clean and clear and uh, moving and for being flexible and uh, nimble as we uh, pull together this sort of technological miracle that we've got going here. Uh, and we would encourage everyone viewing to uh, consider attending our upcoming events. Um, they are like this, they are interactive and informative and will get you thinking about other professions that you'll be working with in the future. And um, I don't know, Eileen, do you have any final words you wanna share? No, I just want to thank the C CC team for their expertise and uh, in handling all these uh, logistics that we can't even imagine. So thank you, team, and uh, well done, Grace and the LEND team. We appreciate you. And, and please uh, give our best to Tess next time you talk about her, talk to her, and let her know that we're all, uh, we're all uh, pulling for her, her, event, her future success. We certainly will. Thanks everyone. I give you back two minutes to your day. <laughs> <laughs>